Hello, I'm Sula. Welcome to my channel. This is part two of Deep Sky Challenge, the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is also known as Messier 1 or M1 and is found in the constellation Taurus the Bull. The Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant. A supernova is a massive explosion that occurs when a massive star dies. In part one, I went into greater detail about supernovae. And here's the link to that video and also in the description below. The exploding star that resulted in the Crab Nebula supernova remnant occurred in 1054 AD. And it was recorded by Chinese and Japanese astronomers and perhaps by Native American Indians, the ancestral Pueblans, at Chaco Culture. I visited Chaco Culture National Historical Park last summer, and there is a pictograph there that the National Park Service has labeled the Supernova Pictograph. But when we hiked out to it on the Penasco Blanco Trail and looked at it, it didn't look like a representation of a supernova to me. And I was somewhat skeptical that the Park Service had latched onto that. Then this year, while reading a book about archaeoastronomy by Dr. Bradley Schaefer, I learned that he, in fact, disputes that this pictograph depicts the Crab Nebula at all. I didn't find his reasoning very persuasive, though, and to me it's an open question whether the pictograph is a representation of the supernova of 1054. But either way, this supernova did occur in 1054, and it was so bright that it lit up the sky during the day for more than 20 days, and it was visible to the naked eye at night for 653 days. The supernova shone four times brighter than Venus at magnitude minus six, and was no doubt witnessed in many places around the world. You can see the remnants of the spectacular event today through your telescope as the Crab Nebula supernova remnant. The Crab Nebula is currently magnitude 8.4, so it's not visible to the naked eye, but it can be seen with an instrument as small as binoculars from a dark sky site or a small telescope. In 7x50 binoculars, it will just appear as a smudge but with larger instruments, you'll be able to make out the shape of the nebula, which took on the name Crab Nebula after a sketch of it by Lord Rossi in 1844, which resembled a crab. In large aperture telescopes of more than 15 inches, you'll be able to make out filaments in the nebula. The Crab Nebula is fairly large with an apparent size of six by four arc minutes. The Crab Nebula is 6,500 light years away and it was discovered in 1731 by John Bevis, and then later independently discovered by Charles Messier, August 28, 1758, as he was looking for the return of Comet Halley. When Charles Messier realized that this nebula was not a comet, it became the first entry in his famous catalog. When we look at the Crab Nebula today, what we're looking at is the material ejected from the dying star during the supernova explosion that ended that star's life. This deep sky object is fairly easy to see, but the deep sky challenge part of this deep sky challenge is not easy at all. In fact, it's very difficult and that is to try to see the pulsar at the core of the Crab Nebula, known as PSR B05321 plus 21. When the star died in the massive supernova of 1054, it left a neutron star at its core. This neutron star is spinning 30 times per second, and it emits pulses. On November 9, 1968, astronomers at the Arecibo Radio Observatory, which is now sadly collapsed but made famous as the observatory where Jodie Foster was stationed in the movie Contact, noted a pulsating radio source in the Crab Nebula, making it one of the first pulsars ever identified, and the first pulsar identified in the visible part of the light spectrum. Fascinating object and the subject of intense study in the late 1960s. Recently, I learned that some people with very sensitive eyes have reported seeing the pulses or flickers emitted by the crab pulsar found near the center of the crab nebula. Bob King, writer for Sky and Telescope, reported seeing the crab pulsar in a 30-inch telescope, and Howard Banich, 
who also occasionally writes for Sky and Telescope, saw the pulses in his 20-inch Dobsonian, he said, with difficulty. And another person whose name I don't know said he saw it in his 16-inch telescope at 600 times magnification at a SQM 21.5 site on a night of excellent seeing. Pretty neat. Let's have a look at the Crab Nebula and see what we can see. I doubt I can see the pulses or flickers coming from the Crab Pulsar since the largest telescope I own is a 15-inch telescope, but I'm thinking I'll at least be able to see the filaments, or I hope to. I've seen the Crab Nebula many times. The smallest instrument that I've ever seen it in was an 80 millimeter refractor from a Bortel 4 site. This time I'll try to see it with 10 by 42 binoculars, 15 by 70 binoculars, my 10 inch Dobsonian, which I'll use to sketch whatever I see. And then I'll see if I can detect the pulses coming from the Crab Pulsar in my 15 inch telescope. But if Bob King couldn't see the pulsar in his 15-inch telescope, I highly doubt I'll be able to, but you never know. It's very easy to find the Crab Nebula. It's in Taurus the Bull, and it can be seen in winter in the Northern Hemisphere. To find it, first look for the Eye of the Bull, the red supergiant Aldebaran that is itself a supernova candidate. And then from there, go to the Southern Horn of the Bull to Zeta Tauri, a third magnitude star, east-northeast of Aldebaran, and M1 is just one degree north and one degree west of Zeta Tauri, just slightly south and a half a degree west of a magnitude 6 star, Struve 742. The Crab Nebula is close to the ecliptic, and so it's occasionally um, occulted by the moon and has conjunctions with planets. Let's have a look at the Crab Nebula. Hello again. I'm out here at a dark sky site. It's a very nice evening, very clear. And I looked at the Crab Nebula with these 15 by 70 binoculars. It was a little bit difficult because the Crab Nebula is very high right now. And it just looked like a smudge in these binoculars. But I saw it. I'm gonna see if I can see it in 10 by 42 binoculars. And then I'm gonna go to my 10 inch Dobsonian and see if I can see not just the Crab Nebula, I know I can see that, but <laughs> whether I can see the neutron star at the center of the Crab Nebula, I don't think so, but I'm going to look at it. Since I made part one, I found out that to see the neutron star pulsing <laughs> in the center of the Crab Nebula takes a very large telescope, way larger than my largest telescope, <laughs> which I don't even have with me. I just have this 10 inch telescope, which is a big telescope. But I found out in an article I read recently that only a few people have seen it, I guess. Bob King saw it in a 30 inch telescope and Howard Banach saw it with difficulty in his 20 inch Dobsonian and some guy named something Block, I can't remember his name, sorry if you're watching this by some weird chance, saw it in his 16-inch Dobsonian, but he said it was very hard and it takes a night of great transparency and good seeing. So I'm not going to be able to see it, but I'm going to look at it anyway, and later I'm going to look with a bigger telescope when I get back to where that telescope is and see what I can see. Okay, I think I saw it with these 10 by 42 binoculars. It's just this tiny smudge in these binoculars, but I just wanted to see if I could see it. Now I'm going over to the 10 inch Dobsonian and have a look. The Crab Nebby looks very, very nice in this 10 inch Dobsonian. I used a, an O3 filter, since it's a supernova remnant, to see if I could make out some of the filaments in it, and I think I did and it looked very very nice. I did not see any pulsing coming from the center of the crab. There's a 16th magnitude star according to Bob King which is beyond the capability of the 10 inch telescope so I couldn't use that as a guide but I kind of just stared at the center. I did not see any pulsing or flickering so now it's time to go on to something bigger, but it looks very, very nice, the Crab Nebula, in a 10-inch telescope with an O3 filter. 
very nice. It's a very cool object. And you can make out the lopsided shape of it too. Very cool. Well, I couldn't see the crab pulsar, and I doubt I ever will, because I don't own a big enough telescope, and I don't know anyone who owns such a large instrument. However, I enjoyed studying this beautiful supernova remnant with my binoculars, with my telescope, and with my big telescope that I have not yet named. And I hope you got to see it too. Let me know what you saw. That's it for now. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see y'all soon. Till then, get outside and enjoy the night sky. Dark skies forever. Sula, signing off. <laughs>